And um, without further ado, I would like to open uh, questions to the floor. Then uh, we'll just take three questions first, introduce yourself and direct to the panelists. I'm Jeff Bo again. Um, first of all, I'm not sure how much time do I have because I want to basically summarize my thoughts. Three minutes? All right, thank you. I've just uh, summarized my thoughts here on my uh, digital paper. So, okay. In 1995, I was baptized as a Christian. And uh, I have to make it short. One of the reasons why I eventually became a free thinker, at the moment I think I prefer to call myself agnostic rather than atheist. <laughs> okay, and uh, one of the reasons why I didn't like Christians is they view Muslims as on the wrong side, on the evil side, which I didn't agree. I said Muslims to me half brothers. Okay, and. Uh, Okay, and then the, from my observation throughout the years, uh, other than the fact that evolution come back to me as more convincing than creation, <laughs> that's another reason why I hardly go to church. But anyway, they still welcome me anytime. <laughs> that's one thing beautiful about Christians. And uh, another reason is that religion seems to create a lot of conflicts. So in my mind, is uh, it's religion. I forgot to mention the title just now. Part two of my, supposed to be a question, end up a speech here. Part two is going to be provocative and mind-boggling. This is part one, okay, very quickly. Is religion obsolete, actually is my title. Is religion obsolete in this modern age? Okay, religion seems to have, have created a lot of conflicts and still creating a lot of cre uh, conflicts and a lot of problems. And the question is, is religion doing more good than bad? also has been in my mind. Okay, in the 2012 Christmas party, uh, make it very short, is I was invited to, the, uh, to a Christmas party by a senior or an elder of a church. And I saw a Malay uh, family who came later, and all of them, from a grandma, there was a grandma with a couple, with, a, if I'm not wrong, two daughters and one son, all of them singing carol songs. I also touched my heart in Malaysia. First time in my life in Malaysia, I saw that. My question to my fellow Malaysia Muslims, is it right or wrong? And also to Dr. Anas, is it right or wrong? Because when I spoke to my Haji friend, he said, no, that's wrong. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> okay, is it right to, or wrong for Muslims to sing carol songs? Okay, now part two is going to be very provocative and mind-boggling. It's based on my, uh, I'm a civil engineer by training, based on rational and logical thinking. Okay, religion to me is, uh, I think it's outdated knowledge or belief system because especially, uh, I think it started from the West, especially the Renaissance or the French pronounced as Renaissance and uh, Industrial Revolution and uh, from a human observation is probably one of the most, most dominant uh, part of our knowledge uh, gathering. Our belief system, um, or rather our knowledge, depth and breadth is just, I use the description, astronomical. We have paleontology, anthropology, archaeology, sociology, psychology, blah, 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 logy, and so on. And uh, all I want to say is uh, I just hope you can follow my track of mind, a bit long-winded. I believe dinosaurs once ruled the earth because of the bones evidence, the fossils, and so on. And now, human, the, the earth is dominated by homo sapiens. And, uh, okay, my ending part of the speech is, uh, I've attended exhibitions by the, uh, organized by Wisma SGM some years back. SGM stands for Sokogakai, Malaysia, Japanese Buddhism. In fact, uh, that was the first time I was very uh, impressed with the exhibition because it was held by uh, one of the sponsors was Adenir, Adenir Foundation. The topic, I mean, their, their, their theme was global ethics. In fact, to me, that's a very good start. You know, 
talking about all the uh, religions, the background, history, and so on, and they summarize, you know, uh, it's a bit rusty, I have no time to go through all of them, you know, about global ethics. And uh, I think we human beings, actually, we are all in the, as uh, Dr. Anas, you mentioned about mobility, social mobility, and so on, and exposure, and now with the internet, uh, internet uh, technology, and uh, it's uh, called ICT world, I think we are always in the process of defining what's good and what's right versus what's bad or wrong. I cannot elaborate further talking about legalizing prostitution in <laughs> Holland, for example. They probably feel it's right <laughs> okay, versus more orthodox uh, thinking of the various religions. Okay, let me just quote this that I received some years back. Uh, I probably have about 30 seconds to speak here which I think is, uh, I'm not sure whether was it really by our uh, wise man Gandhi, seven dangers to human virtue. Number one, wealth without work. Two, pleasure without conscience. Three, knowledge without character. Four, business without ethics. Five, science without humanity. And six, religion without sacrifice. Last, which is actually, as Dr. Anas said, Politics agenda is always seems to be preceding. Politics without principle. Okay, so I'd like to finish off my speech by saying that my belief system now is one human race, one human compassion, one humane world. Shorter, one race, one compassion, one world. Thank you. Right, thank you. Uh, second round, please. Assalamualaikum warahmatullah. Uh, my name is Ainul. I'm from Ahmadiyya Muslim community. As uh, Dr. Azmi said just now, that uh, everyone is a right to live without fear. But I think it's not for the minority group now, because every minority group, especially for us, for Ahmadi, we are living with fear. Because to practice our belief, to practice our duty to Allah, to God, we fear that the religious authority will arrest us. <coughs> uh, as uh, Dr. Anas, uh, you based in UK, I believe you must heard about uh, Ahmadiyya, how Ahmadiyya has been accepted in the uh, Europe country and in Britain itself. But unfortunately, in Malaysia uh, or in Muslim country, Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh, Arab countries, Indonesia, and of course, Malaysia and Brunei, we have been persecuted. Uh, and what makes us very, very sad, this uh, uh, persecution comes from our Muslim brothers. I mean, Muslim brothers, not our, my Muslim brothers who are here now, because our Muslim brothers who are in this hall, we have fight for the uh, minority group. I'm talking about the Muslim brothers outside there who stand against the minority. And it's very, very sad that since the persecution come from our Muslim brothers outside there. Recently, in Malaysia itself, 38 of our members, including myself, have been arrested because we pray our Juma not in the mosque who, which is uh, uh, recognized by the Islamic authority. We pray in another place and we have been arrested. So what role uh, can uh, Dr. Anas, as uh, chairman of the international institution in Britain, can play to make other Muslims to understand that the differences in interpretation is not give their, uh, the right to them uh, to persecute Ahmadis or the other minority groups. So I hope uh, because you is a well known in Britain, maybe you can play a role to make them understand. And I hope you can convey the message that you has just give us today to the uh, so-called Muslim leader to understand that how important to protect the rights of the minority groups. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, uh, Aino. Uh, one last question for the first round. Yep. 
Yeah, my name is uh, Lee T. K. Lee. I'm from the Baha'i community. And uh, I'm very impressed with uh, Dr. Anna's um, reading of the international perspective, and especially that how society has evolved from the mid 19th century to so called the modern world. And there are so many forces that's been shaping and changing. And that uh, new concept will have to be rewritten or uh, re looked at in light of, uh, in cast of certain universal principles. And I believe that um, writing's future, as we are now that not just entails upon the leaders, but also upon the common folk like us. And perhaps, perhaps maybe we should have on the premise of the principle of the oneness of humanity, because you could see that the world has been changing. And in terms of whether it's for political or for commercial things, you could, you could see it even in Malaysia too. We have millions of uh, foreigners, I wouldn't say foreigners, but fellow uh, um, inhabitants of the earth. Because like you say that even you use the word foreigners, it depicts an otherness. But rather we use citizens of the world are uh, so residing in, in, this, in this land, likewise it's in, 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 uh, in England. So you could see that the country itself is changing. The world is changing whereby it is no longer with one particular ethnic group. And you see that inhabitants as one. So perhaps maybe we look at this principle of the one of humanity and we write from there, how then structures in society will have to reflect on this oneness how would our in social interactions will have that, and, s and even amongst the communities? So your comments, please, uh, Dr. Anas. Um, okay. Um, again, there's a lot of commonality in terms of the ideas as, uh, and the questions that have uh, come up, and I'll try to address them um, uh, collectively. When uh, we're talking about Religion. I mean, today I hear a lot about this argument that religion is uh, the biggest catalyst for division and hatred and wars and the such. And um, uh, and whilst obviously there, I mean, we could all collectively come up with ample examples of, of how religion has played a role in strife and war and violence and bloodshed. But let's not forget that actually the, you know, the most heinous crimes committed by humanity weren't done under the the guise of religion. They were actually done under the guise of secular politics. I mean, Hitler wasn't known, renowned to be a religious leader. Uh, the Americans who bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945 didn't do so under the guise of, you know, uh, the church. Uh, and the authoritarian dictata dictata dictatorships that rule most Muslim countries aren't religious at all. In fact, I gave the example of Iraq ruled by the Ba'ath Party, and Syria today ruled by, again, the Ba'ath Party, uh, ultra-secular, anti-religious uh, parties that committed so much harm, so much uh, violence, so much hurt. They wiped out generations from their own countries, from their own uh, kith and kin. So, um, so actually, I think that there's an argument against secularism as much as if, if we wish to pursue that particular argument, there is much of an argument against secularism as there is against religion. So I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, uh, commit to that particular idea, and I think that we need a little bit more investigation. Um, I think that the kind of religion that leads to violence, and this I go back even to colonial times, uh, to the Crusades, if you wish. Even the Crusades, to me, I mean, people talk about the, the church and the such. I don't think it was actually a religious uh, battle. It was essentially a political battle that used the sentiments of Christians in order to fight the holy war on behalf of corrupt leaders, political and religious. <coughs> and that is a story that we can tell a thousand times again across many, many incidents along history. I'm sometimes confronted by historians who say, well, you know, the Ottomans, they went and they did this to the Armenians. I said, yes, it was, you know, political corruption that, you know, using the, the guise of religion in order to, to mobilize the masses and commit something that was in the favor at the time of the political elite. It's a story that's, that's, that's you know, that we see time and time and time happen again. So, um, so I think that we need to delve a little bit deeper in, uh, um, in, in uh, sort of, um, looking at that particular point. Um, you asked, a, I mean, you, you cited a particular example of an entire family singing the carol songs and you said the question. Now, 
Um, I would like to think that it's, it's down to the individual whether they want to sing it or not. I mean, whether they want to take part in any particular event or not. I'd like to think that we are in a, you know, that's the kind of society that we are in whereby people make, their, make up their own choices of what they do, you know, in mutual respect and in acknowledgement of the other, without, you know, in the, in the kind of terms that we've spoken about today. And therefore, I'm not going to say that this is either, uh, you know, it's not done in terms of good or bad. It's, it's done in terms of, well, is it, is it someone's right to do so and have they chosen do, to do so voluntarily and for the right reasons or not? Now, I come to the bigger concept here because I think it's quite important. In what I've been saying at least today, and I think that also the, the rest of the speakers have, have uh, yeah, would, would more or less, I think that what we've said uh, agrees on this point, and that is, we're not talking here about melting the lines between us. Ultimately, I'm an Arab Muslim. Uh, someone here is a, a Malay, someone else is a Chinese, someone else is a, an Indu, uh, an, a Hindu Indian, for instance, and as such. There's no problem with me upholding my ethnicity and my religion and abiding by it. That itself isn't a problem. The problem is that when I see myself as having greater rights than the other, simply because of my ethnicity or my faith or my creed, that's where the problem lies. And therefore, I would call, I would in fact encourage Christians bring up their children to bring them up according to Christian values. I don't want them to be brought up in a mishmash of faith between Christianity and Islam and Judaism so that ultimately they don't know exactly who they are. No, no, no. If they belong to Christian parents who are devout Christian parents, I want them to grow up according to the firm, clear principles of Christianity. The same with Jews, the same with Hindus, the same with Buddhists, and the same with Muslims. The issue. I want my children to grow up as strong, devout Muslims. But I want them to recognize that they have an exact equal share of rights as well as responsibilities as anyone else. And that their ethnicity, their faith, their famili family line or the such, that has no consideration in how much they are appropriated in terms of rights or responsibilities. So I don't want... I'm not expecting, nor am I calling, for Christian children to come and, and, uh, and recite the Qur'an in Muslim classes. Uh, I'm not calling for, for Muslim children to go and, and read the scriptures of, uh, of Hinduism, for instance. That's not the... We're not, we're not in a, in a, in a religion, religionless uh, existence here. That would be... Uh, that's not what I'm calling for. That's not what I'm advocating. I don't even think that's a good idea. I just want people to recognize that we live side by side. We do happen to believe simply because we have the freedom to. We believe in different things and we practice things in different ways. We need to appreciate and acknowledge each other and have the kind of respect to engage in a debate, an intellectual debate, with that kind of respect, with that kind of mutual appreciation and acknowledgement still intact. Let's have those interfaith debates but not to belittle the other, not to prove the other wrong, but to see how we can work together to make our collective existence better and for the generations that will succeed us to live in a better life. That's the kind of, of existence I'm talking about. My friends and my brothers from the Ahmadi and the Baha'i sect, I think that generally speaking, <coughs> I agree with the sentiments that you've said. <coughs> and, uh, and the things that, I mean, uh, my brother here, he, he suggested that I, I send a message and I speak, and uh, this is what I've been doing for years now. That the fact that we're different is a reality, and as I said, we're not to diminish that kind of difference. Everyone is right to uphold and to be proud of their lineage, of their faith, of their creed. Everyone has the right to do so. Um, but in that kind of, uh, of, of atmosphere of, of collective responsibility, but that kind of difference, as someone said correctly, there is absolutely no uh, right or premise to persecute upon that particular difference. For instance, I mean, let, let, let me tell you about a, a discussion that we're having largely in the West, as I'm pretty sure that you're, uh, you're following. 
Um, and that is the issue of the rights of gays and lesbians and homosexuals. Okay? Now, people have asked me this several times. And they consider this as a, as, a, as a tricky area. And I don't see why this is. They ask me, oh, what, what does Islam think about homosexuals? And I, think, and, and I say, well, Islam differentiates between the person and the act. As a person, as a person, as an individual, whoever that person is, remains under the realm of the verse that I quoted earlier, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي Adam." We have dignified the sons of Adam, whoever they are. And therefore, that person, that human being, has equal rights and responsibilities as anyone else. Then there is the act. The act itself, according to my faith, is seen as wrong. But that does not in any way infringe on the rights and responsibilities of the human being. At all. So, the, the call for persecution is the problem here. The difference of you is, is fine. We are different and we believe in different things and we practice things differently. But to persecute, that is absolutely wrong. And therefore, to think that someone else is indulging in something which I believe is wrong is one thing. But to treat them as less than human beings and as people who are fair play to be targeted and persecuted, that's a, total, a totally different thing and that in itself is a crime and a sin in, in the religion's eyes. So, um, in the same way, I mean, this message we talk, and, and this is not going to be easy. I mean, I, I face a lot of opposition um, because people, it's easier for people in a, <coughs> in a diverse world to sort of retreat behind the kind of borders and, and dividing lines that they're comfortable with, their safety zones, you know, their comfort zones. They, they feel more comfortable talking amongst themselves and sort of describing the other. It's as though this is the way to make my son be proud of being a Muslim is to tell him, oh look, you know, those Christians, those Hindus, those Buddhists, those Jews, they're, they're, they're much less, they're, they're inhumane. I remember, I remember being told by a friend of mine who was a Shi'i. He said, Anas, you know, the things that my parents used to tell me about you and your family, you know, you would, uh, and, and I say, what? Tell me, tell me. And he said, one of the things they used to say is that you Sunnis have tails. Have tails. <laughs> See, now, the other day, I was telling this story. I was telling this story to someone who is a Baha'i. And he said the same thing. It's as though there is this book that goes around every single faith and people read and try. I mean, well, what's going on? Who, it seems that those who are writing these things are the same people. And they just use one against the other. And it's, it's just, uh, it's, just um, a w it's, it's the way of the, of, the, of the toothless, of the poor, of the weak. The, the only way to assert my own self is to show the weaknesses of the other. I had, uh, I mean this, I'm going to end with this because I've taken far too long. I had a friend of mine, uh, we were at college. And uh, he managed to get together a few uh, hundred pounds and to buy himself a car. Actually, it was exactly, precisely 110 pounds, um, which, which is, I mean, this is nothing. I mean, you can't even have, me and Azmi can't even go to a restaurant in London and have a meal for 100. But he got a car for 110 pounds. I couldn't tell you, it was a, a, a wheelbarrow with wheels. It was a bad, a really tatty, really rubbish car. Um, and you know when uh, we would go to a shopping mall, for instance, or a, or a supermarket, and there would be a public car park, he would go round and round and missing spaces. I would say, this is a space, no, no, no. And he would go round and round, and we would be wasting time just going around, and I'd say, what, what are you looking for? And he would be looking at the shabbiest, dirtiest, oldest car to park next to. Because if he parked next to a good car, his car would be seen to be really shabby. But if he parked next to a, an equally shabby car, it wouldn't look too bad. And it seems that that's the way that we're dealing. You know, in order to cover our own fallacies and weaknesses, we need to expose and amplify the weaknesses and the inhumanities of others. I think there needs, as I said, I think we need to go back to the level of the debate, of the narrative. And we need to go back to the earliest common denominator, 
at preschool level and start instigating a new set of principles and ideals in what we teach our children. That way, when they get to the age of 15, 18, 20, we wouldn't have to start treating illnesses and diseases in the narrative, in the mind, in the intellect. They'll already be there. They'll already be, you know, have dealt with mo most of that particular uh, ground. Thank you, Thank you. Second round, yeah, please. Sorry, uh, I'm Robert Fu. Uh, uh, we, we are talking about persecution in the name of religion, and uh, I like uh, what uh, Dr. Anas, you said about the fact that we actually have to go back to the, the original uh, source of the problem, which is the narratives. Uh, but as a Malaysian, and of course, I mean, no, of course, but I'm a non-Muslim, I'm a Christian. Um, but I like what is being done in RF and this kind of forum, tonight because I think uh, this is excellent. But my point here is that persecution may start from narratives, but as a non-Muslim sometimes, well, I wouldn't say it's a persecution, but um, an imposing situation where uh, because the majority religion, so to speak, in Malaysia is Muslim, uh, but there is some, such a thing as a, as a what do you call it, a, a covert way of persecution. You know, it's not, it's, not, it's not done openly, but it's covert. I, I give you an example. I mean, I, I do respect all the religions and things like that, but I have to say this. Uh, things like, um, you know, uh, if, you have, if you go to school, right, uh, essentially uh, now they have these practices of about saying the doa during assembly and all that. I mean, if you're a non-Muslim child, you know, and then the, the headmaster says, okay, let's all say the dua. Oh, it's okay, you guys are not Muslim. You can still say in your own religion, but we are... So, you know, although you don't say it's persecution, but in a way, it's actually like a little bit of a, you know, an imposition on a young, a young, man, a young person's mind about, hey, you know, am I doing the right thing? You know, because everybody else is doing this way, and I'm doing it that way. Maybe I'm wrong. So that is actually a way of... A, uh, a covert way of persecution. Now, another example, well, I wouldn't, I'm not sure whether it's a good example, is that um, uh, if you have um, uh, many uh, mosques around, which I got no problem about uh, people having the azan and things like that. I mean, that's the religion. But if you have a situation here, I'm not sure I'm going to get in trouble, <laughs> but you, if you have the azan and you use huge loudspeakers and you blast in the neighborhood and all that. There's no problem with Azan, but there's a problem with the volume. I think there was a Muslim in Johor or something like that who was actually taking on an issue about this and said that he is disturbing his sleep. You know? So, uh, but if you look at it that way, it becomes like a very covert way of oppressing. You know? So, what is your view in terms of this sort of... Uh, uh, so-called persecution in terms, in form, right, not in real substance, you know, they don't kind of persecute you, but by form, by majority, by changing the environment, you know, you, you feel as though that, you know, you're being persecuted. What's your view of that? <coughs> Alright, thank you. Uh, second question, please. Yeah, what's the answer? Answer? Um, hi. Uh, Dr. Anas, you said that um, you are perfectly fine with Christian parents raising Christian kids in a Christian manner, but you also say that you want these Christian kids to see people from other religions as equals, right? Um, based on my personal experience, when I was younger and I asked my religious elders, you know, why am I a Muslim? They would say, oh, it's a better religion. You won the golden lottery of, at birth. You know, you're going to go to heaven straight away. So my question to you is that, you know, if you, if you want the, the child to be raised up in a particular religion and you want the child to also respect people from other religions and see them as equals, what answer would you give to the child who asks, why am I a Christian? Yes, of course. Turn around, okay? Turn around. Uh, my question, the first question, I would like to address it to Dr. Anas. 
<clears throat> during my school days, you know, uh, in fact, at this stage in life also, people always say that all religion preaches good values, uh, regardless of uh, Islam or Christian or Judaism or Buddhism. <clears throat> so, to that, that, that's a catchy word, good common universal values. You know. And um, personally, from my own personal point of view, I see no harm that if people who are dedicated to their belief, their religion, they are harmless to you, to your existence, to your belief. So I, I find that um, there is this overemphasis of your own belief that you want to be in a position of dominance. That's the fundamental weakness at this point in time, you know. And that applies to not just Malaysia, but in Europe, in Africa, and whatever countries you can name. Uh, the second question is to Dr. Azmi. Um, I feel always impressed and at times entertained if the presentation is done by somebody with a legal background. <laughs> and usually at the end of the presentation, I would be, the outcome would be, I'll be very much in agreement with you, or on the other end, hand, be totally confused. But anyway, <laughs> that's what most of my students say. <laughs> but anyway, Dr. Azmi, just now you mentioned about this Sedition Act, and going by history that you narrated just now, it was actually initiated by the British in the 40s to prevent us, the Malayans at that time, to express our dissatisfaction or unhappiness with the colonial powers at that time. So they introduced this act. So going by that logic, when we got our independence, that sedition, uh, that sedition act, by significance, would have been lost. There's no more the need for a sedition act. But somehow or other, along the way, the successor to the British have found some other useful use for it. So, uh, by the way you describe the Sedition Act, I find it to be rather generic. You know? When I say generic, this is a sort where you quote the example that anything under the sky, if you missed out on it, any other provision, you can apply Sedition Act. So, it's the problem in the generic definition. And it's a solution by making it more customized to the local context. And the second question to you is that I do read across some uh, legal uh, framework in other countries. While we outsource our legislation making to our elected representative in parliament, in some countries, whereas any bill or law passed in parliament, they would have a provision of for public consultation. Uh, if this is introduced in Malaysia, would that affect the what you call the quality, the speediness or effectiveness of the law that Parliament intend to pass? Okay, that's all. Thank you, Richard. Uh, <coughs> with regard to Sedition Act as uh, an old relic, I guess there are a lot of other laws as well. 377A, for example, it was passed, uh, I mean, it was following the time of the Victorian age, right? And it was used in this country since 1938. Seven cases were charged under 377A. Carnal intercourse, consensual carnal intercourse against the order of nature. And out of these seven, since 1938, four were being applied to Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim. <laughs> So what does it mean? It means that it was being done as a political tool to persecute your political opponents. Yeah, I think I'll leave it to Dr. Uh, uh, Azmi to answer, or first perhaps, uh, Anas, would you like to answer? Yeah, yes. all right, sure. Uh, okay. You see, part of the problem that we're dealing with, uh, where, because uh, most of the questions that were asked in this second round, and also um, in the first session as well this morning, um, are specific cases. We're now going down beyond the, the concepts um, to detailed cases. What I would like us to come to an agreement, uh, generally, generally, I mean, I, I, we don't want consensus. I mean, consensus is bad. I, I, you know, 
it might, might be seen to be a good thing, but I don't think it is. I mean, I think it's always good to have some, you know, other opinion or the such. But um, I think, I mean, I would like to think that generally speaking, we have agreed on the concepts, okay? Because that's the most important thing. Then the details, we could come to work out how they work. Um, but since some of the details are being asked, uh, some specifics about, you know, prayers in, in schools, for instance, Evan, these are specific details, and they are important. But you see, what's happening here is that essentially through the questions that are being asked, and they are real questions, and they are quite important questions, and I'm pretty sure that if we had more time, we could come up with dozens more questions. The issue is that all these questions are born out of a climate of fear and apprehension. They are born out of a climate of division, of one and the other. That's why. If society was to arrive at an agreement and a consensus that this variation is to its own wealth, to its own richness, to its own affluence, to its own prosperity, if rights were asserted and implemented, if freedoms were protected, if government was held responsible and seen as a servant to the public, if civil society took its full role and played it efficiently, we would come up with young people who are confident enough to be who they are and mix with other contexts. We wouldn't need those separating walls. We wouldn't need to be worried that my son is a, is a, is a, is a Muslim child, but uh, you know, he's taking part in Christmas uh, festivities, for instance, at school. I wouldn't be worried about it. I mean, I often, before my, I mean, my people would ask, uh, you know, where do your children go to? And I would say, you know, they, they go to an independent school. And, and they would say, well, why not a Muslim school? Why? And I say, why would they want to go to a Muslim school? You know, answer me this. Why, why would they need to go to a Muslim school? I said, so that, you know, because if they go to a non-Muslim school, they'll be influenced. I said, well, why don't you think that if they go to a non-Muslim school, they will influence their environment? Why is it that they're always going to be influenced? So we think sometimes too little of ourselves and our children, and therefore we keep them indoors. We keep them behind closed, you know, fences or the such. So I think that most of these questions will come to be addressed when society is confident with itself, with its own being, with who it is. Like I said, at this moment of time, the issue of Islamophobia and rising racism generally against immigrants of all sorts, Muslims and none in Europe, is a result of Europe being in a very fragile position economically, politically, and in terms of their identity itself. I mean, as Tony Blair, when he sort of uh, through that particular hand grenade and said in a speech, you know, we need to go back to asserting our Britishness. And all of a sudden the media had a, a you know, a field day with him saying, well, what do you mean by being British? Does it mean that you watch cricket? Do you, does it mean that you eat fish and chips? Does it mean that you, I mean, what does it mean? What does it mean to be British? What does it mean? What, and, and then on one uh, particularly uh, important uh, program, uh, he was asked this, and he said, well, British uh, is about uh, fair play and love of, uh, uh, you know, equality and freedom and justice, and he said, well, I'm pretty sure that the people in China and India and elsewhere also love the same thing. So what makes it unique? What makes Britishness unique? So all of a sudden, Germans are asking, what does it mean to be German? The French, what does it mean to be French? What? It's a, a, a silly question, and it shows a state of fragility when someone needs something to identify myself different from anyone else in order to assert my being, to justify my being, to justify that I matter, I mean something. When I'm at confidence with myself, I wouldn't care about these issues. I would be happy enough calling myself a human being. So, the, all these questions, all these situations, which I acknowledge are absolutely real, and, in, and we can't wait for another 30 years to address them, of course not, I, I'm not suggesting that, but what I'm saying is that if we agree on the concepts and we agree on the vision that we're trying to arrive at together, we should also realize that many of those issues will be solved by the by. The thing is that we get too hell-bent and we create deeper divisions by addressing those small details now before we've agreed and asserted the, the, the concepts. So in a state whereby division is the rule of the game, I'm trying to address this particular issue and try to arrive at it. It doesn't work. 
However, if you were to ask me, I mean, and the same thing was was uh, uh, was a point of debate in a in a government uh, sponsored meeting in Turkey that I took part in several years ago, eight nine years ago probably. And this question about there is a particular neighbourhood in Ankara that is resided uh, wholly by orth uh, Orthodox Christians, and there is a mosque nearby, and they're complaining. And they're saying, listen, you know, we can we can take the dhuhr, the afternoon and late afternoon, adhan, but you know, the late evenings when it gets to 10, 10, 30, for instance, when in the morning fajr is about 3 a.m. I mean, it's it's just too much. So, the Muslim governor of the district, the mayor of the district, he took things in his own hand to the detriment of his own popularity at the time. And he said to the mosque, you know what? At that particular moment of time, you reduce the, the volume of your, of your adhan to something like a fifth of what it was, and you make it shorter. You know, rather than the, the long singing of, 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 of the adhan, you just say it very, very quickly, and then you, you switch off. And at the time, obviously, there were some scholars and religious leaders that went into uproar. Now, see, they're changing into a, we're, we're going to now become a Christian country and all this. No, Turkey hasn't become a Christian country. It's just become a country that's more sensitive to the needs of its citizens. And that's all we need. That's all we need. So I think that there are many things that could be addressed in a sun sensible, commonsensical way that most people would agree on. But in a climate of fear, that common sense doesn't work. When I talk to Iraqis today about, you know, there is no difference between Sunnis and Shias. They always say, well, well, yeah, fine, but there was a Shia that killed Sunnis the other day, and there were some Sunnis that bombed Shias, the other day. and all of a sudden we go back to talking about anecdotes, real, they're not invented, they're real, but which assert that division is a must. Oh, well, you know, I would love to be one with them, but they don't want to be one with me. And all of a sudden, it's not my fault, it's the others. And we have that kind of argument. And that's why I say we need to agree on the concepts. Don't go down to the details at the very beginning. You do that, you kill off the whole debate. Agree on the concepts. When everyone has signed up to the concepts, then you can start working on asserting those concepts as part of, as I said, of that narrative from the earliest possible age. And you overcome many of those issues as you go along. You won't be addressing every single point of those thousands of points that we can talk about. You won't need to address them because they will address themselves. Um, right. Okay. This. Yeah, you're right. The Sedition Act. Should we change it to local context? What does that mean? You know, I mean, actually, I think we should just get rid of it completely. Yeah? Just, just, just throw it away. Um, any criticism, because the way it's v v worded, you know, it's very difficult to safely criticize government. And of course, government should be criticized. Um, so, you know, if you want to change things, well, I can think of things like uh, anti-hate speech law, which would be a good thing. But I don't trust the government, you see, because right now, I, you know, my, my view of anti-hate speech, uh, my view of he hate speech is like uh, pro promoting hate uh, for a class of people, etc. Their view of hate speech should be, could mean promoting hate against the Prime Minister is hate speech, you know. So, <laughs> you, you cannot, they cannot be trusted. So right now, I don't want to make any new laws because it could be worse than the old ones. Um, with regards to public consultation in, in, in legislative process, of course. Of course, it's, it's a good thing. And our legislative process is very, very fast. Yeah? I mean, you can speak to any law student, the guy sitting next to you, he will tell you that um, it can be passed very, very quickly if they wanted it, with very little debate, even in parliament. So to force public consultation would be a good thing. Would it make things slower? Yeah, not much slower, because I don't think that many people want to get involved. You know, uh, there's, there's a misconception that if you open it to the public, there'll be so much public involvement. No, Malaysian publics want to watch TV and they don't want to take part in things like this. You know, it's, it's not that many people who really want to take part in these kind of things. So, it, uh, yeah, well, it's, it's a, uh, but even me, I mean, like, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on about, um, right now, about the delineation of the, of the constituencies, you know, and I've been speaking against it, but I haven't been to one single meeting because, you know, the football's on. Um, but, uh, you know, so it might be slower, but it should be better, right? Uh, because right now, really, you're correct. The, the quality of debate with regards to laws is very, very poor. And if you have public consultation, at the very least, it will open it to the public. Even if you're not taking part in the consultation, at least you're aware that these laws are going to be made. And, 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 and that is an important thing as well. Before suddenly, you know, once it's law, it's very difficult to get rid of it. 
But to be aware of something and say, hold on, I don't like this, then maybe you want to do something about it. At least that publicity is there, you know, that, that, that awareness is there. So I would think that's a good idea. Okay, uh, the last round, uh, I saw some hands, you know, yep. One, two, one more. Yeah, three. Oh, okay, four. All right. I'd just like to make a comment. What a great joy to have the Islamic Renaissance in the Renaissance Hotel. With all the movements of uh, free speech and expression given by, by people, a cross-section of our society in a very fruitful way. The models that Dr. Anas have uh, been speaking is laudable from a non-Muslim non point of view because we look towards different situations and understand that multiplicity is a gift of nature to understand the differences of the others and remain in your own self. For those friends who have been persecuted within the Islamic traditions, those the Ahmadiyyas and the Shias of our Malaysian society, I want to tell you, as a non-Muslim leader, I will stand for you, for your well-being and happiness as a Malaysian citizen. This includes our Baha'i friends as well. Thank you very much. It has been encouraging to me to hear the moderate views of the panelists and uh, I didn't introduce myself earlier, I'm Michael Moy, I teach law in some of the private universities and colleges. And first I would like to apologize to Jeff Poe uh, on behalf of some of the Christians in Malaysia for holding a position of doctrinal supremacy towards others. And this is something that the Christian church in Malaysia is struggling. Um, but on the other hand, I also see this uh, doctrinal supremacy among a certain strand of Islam in my own country. And the refusal to enter into an interfaith dialogue uh, together with other religions um, does not seem fair to me. So that being said, I have enjoyed the kindness of Muslims in my life and I've been trying to understand what it means to live in Malaysia. In university, I had the opportunity to live with a Malay family in Perlis uh, with the study and serve project and that was about 1978. And I lived firsthand with a uh, Muslim family. I slept with their son and how the son was kind to me in, in folding the mosquito net and unfolding it before we sleep. And near where I stay, uh, there are kind Muslims as well and it has changed my perspective on the ground. So one night, uh, this friend of mine, this neighbor, Muslim neighbor, came to my house and said, Michael, here's a key for you to park your car in a surau because there is a spate of uh, carjacking in my area. So I've come to understand that there are Muslims, and there are Muslims, and I thank God for it. But what I'm seeing today is a strand of aggressive Islam in Malaysia. And I appreciate what Dr. Enas has said in his speech. Every Muslim society, in every Muslim society, civil society or NGOs have almost become extinct. And that's pretty frightening to me. And that's a great cause of concern for me. And I appreciate what Dr. Asmi said that we need to continue to strive knocking at the doors of our government. And I want to ask myself this question. How long can we knock? Is it going to work? 
The question that I have is, what hope is there for Malaysia if there is no model of an Islamic society that can be changed for the better? So it goes back to the question of whether there is hope for Malaysia, and that particularly is a question for Dr. Azmi. Uh, do you think we can vote in a new government going by the ordinary processes? If you don't think so, I can understand. But if you think so, how is it going to happen? And what do we need to do? Thank you very much. Um, hello. Um, this question is directed at Dr. Ennis. Um, you said just now that you are in full support of children being brought up in their parents' religion. If, and instead of getting a wish-wash version of many different religions, you want them to be brought up as a proper Christian or a Muslim or a Hindu. But the thing about it is that before, during our first session, you said freedom of religion and, and you emphasized on equity, right? If the child is brought up on, if the child is brought up in that parent's religion, it becomes increasingly hard for the child to escape that religion or respect the other people's religion because the, because the child is constantly reminded that the, the, their particular religion is superior to the other religion. And the punishment and, re, and the persecution that they receive from trying to leave that religion is pretty great in terms of both social and workplace, you might be cut off from your friends, and you might be cut off from your family, you might get fired from your job and such. So I want to know your opinion on how, I mean, because I'm in support of teaching a child various kind of religion so that they can grow up in the future and decide one for themselves if they want to believe in a religion. I want to know your thoughts on that. And another question is, could it be that one of the main causes of why the, the cause of Islamophobia, in, especially in Western culture, is that the rigidity of the Islamic law, which is Sharia and the Hadith. I mean, I was brought up in a Christian uh, family, and I have studied the religion quite intensively as well. And I have realized that over, the, over, the, over two millennia, their laws and doctrines have become rather soft and it has adapted to suit more people so that it can include more number of people without and the severity of the punishment for committing certain number of act has reduced dramatically like we last time in the book of Deuteronomy every Christian is supposed to go outside and kill every single non-Christians out there and obviously you don't see anyone doing that because if I did that right now, I would have been dead or all of you guys would be dead. So maybe is it because the Islamic law is too unchanging? Maybe it's a bit too rigid for the modern world where tolerance and globalization and understanding of different cultures, meanwhile expecting the same thing has, been, has become important. But Islam, while demanding respect and tolerance from the other people, they are not giving the same to the other people. Okay, my name is Mal from Putrajaya. I just want to share my opinion. I noticed um, before independence, Malaysia, uh, my grandparents, my grandmother can have uh, this early marriage. And after independence, I noticed like early marriage uh, now cannot practice. So uh, I'm wondering why this happened and then I got this like thinking that uh, probably bad Jews affect Muslim in Malaysia. That's why government have to follow this uh, like Western way. And then that's uh, for me like this persecution in the name of religion is a post-colonial, like pre-colonial, like uh, early marriage, no such thing of punishment. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Azmi, can you uh, uh, Yeah, it's just one question to me, thank God. Um, how long can we knock? <laughs> Is it going to work? I don't know. Uh, you know, I just keep knocking. Um, because it's the right thing to do. 
you know, and I don't, I don't, you know, frankly, I don't even, th I don't, I, I know, I know, you know, there's a, there's a desire for, for, for results, you know, there's a desire for success, there's a desire to, to finally uh, win, you know, um, and I use that term extremely broadly, but um, maybe I'm weird here, yeah? I don't think like that, right? Um, uh, I, I, I don't know whether I've said to this, you know, but my, my, my favorite film is Rocky. The first one, yeah? Not fourth, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. Yeah? The, and and my, my, the reason I like that so much is because Rocky doesn't win. He just tries really, really hard. And that was heroic by itself. And my favorite football team is Tottenham Hotspurs, and we never win either. We just try very hard, you know, and, and we do it in great style, but, you know, we just try very hard. Um, Next year, next year, yeah. That's what we always say. So maybe that's why I, don't, I can live in this country because I know what it feels like to be in despair and hope every season, right? I don't know, man, but I think... It, look, the, the, the history of humankind is progress. It's slow, it goes back, but it moves forward eventually. I don't want... I, I, I cannot give an answer, but I don't want to give up hope. If we change government, will it make a difference? Yes and no. It will make a difference in the sense that we will, uh, the, the mindset of the people will change. And the, you know, finally, we realize that we can get rid of the buggers, whoever the buggers might be. But will it change one's life in the sense that, will it change one's constant striving to ensure that there is justice, there is equality, there is fairness? No, of course not. Even if we have a DAP government or a PKR government or past government, and I say this because I'm not sure how long the Pakatan Raya is going to last now, right? Okay, if, or an AMNO government or whatever government, whatever government's in power, it's the civil society has to continue to strive because once you stop, once you stop, they will abuse. That is the nature of the beast. We give power to governments because it's necessary for governance. But with that power, if we take our eyes off them, they will misuse it. It is just, if not one, if not many, one. It will happen. That is the nature. No, one's, no one is, is, is incorruptible. And therefore, for me, it doesn't matter who's in power. It doesn't matter because the same kind of striving, the same kind of effort will still be in place. Maybe it will be a bit more cheerful, but it will still be there. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> I'm starting to feel a little bit targeted because most of the questions are coming my way. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, can I, again, uh, I will um, try to address some concepts. First of all, the issue of um, uh, the, f the first question was about an interfaith dialogue. I'll be honest with you, I, I don't see the point. I don't see the point of an interfaith dialogue. I don't think it's important. In fact, if anything, the way that it's been happening, <coughs> yeah, I mean, generally speaking, has been detrimental. It hasn't been good. We haven't seen anything good come. Because I've, I spent a lot of time at the beginning of my career attending uh, interfaith dialogues as either, either an observer or a participant or an advisor. <clears throat> and all I could uh, hear or see is uh, point scoring. Oh, our religion says this. Oh, no, your religion says this. Oh, no, we did this. Oh, no, you killed so many people. You did. And it just basically, I, I couldn't see the point of it. Or we sit around the table and we'd be extremely pleasant with each other and ultimately, we don't understand uh, anything new about each other. It's as though the Christian isn't a Christian anymore, the Muslim isn't a Muslim anymore, the Buddhist isn't a Buddhist anymore. It's as though we've all sort of assigned ourselves to this uh, vague, n religious but non-specific uh, area. I mean, and, and this is not what we want. I would rather, my friends, I mean, this is why I'm, you know, I think that generally the ideas that I have shared with you today are about us um, having a public debate on how we make our societies better. Not on, you know, specifics to my religion or yours. I need you to respect my human rights and my place in society and I need to do the same regarding you. That's essentially the kind of dialogue that we need to have. And if anything, the dialogue that needs to have, the real, I mean, uh, Dr. Azmi has mentioned now time and time again, but the real Adversary is not our Muslims and Buddhists and uh, Buddhists and Hindus and Jews. 
it's between those who are governing and abusing power and taking away our rights and making us feel afraid of the other rather than our next door neighbors. I mean, so we need to really understand that there is a public dialogue to be had, but the premise of that dialogue doesn't need to be about interfaith. If we're there to hear about each other's, you know, I'm often invited to places of worship, various places of worship, to sit in, listen, and also to share my experiences as a Muslim. And I do that. I go around churches, synagogues, temples, and I, I do that. And I think, as much as I can see from the return invitations, that it's, it's helpful, it's useful. But um, I, I'm not entirely sure that at this moment of time that those sort of dialogues are happening on the right kind of premise and achieving the kind of goals that we're all aspiring towards. Um, <clears throat> Um, uh, the, our friend at the, at the, the back, you said that uh, you discovered through your own life experiences that there are Muslims and there are Muslims. And I'll also assure you there are Jews and there are Jews. And there are Christians and there are Christians. And there are Buddhists. And, there, and we need to recognize that. A bad Hindu doesn't, you know, for instance, I don't take all Hindus to be the same as Modi, the, the new prime minister. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that you won't take all Muslims to be like, uh, I don't know, Bin Laden, for instance. And uh, I don't also take all Christians to be like George W. Bush. It's, you know, it's, we have to, we have to recognize that there are anomalies. As I said earlier, there are anomalies in every single society, whether it be a faith society, uh, an ideological society, a political society, an ethnic, racist, there is also always going to be that. And I need to judge people according, and that's why I say I have no problem with Christian parents bringing up and asserting real Christian values in their children. Because if they did, those values would be very close to mine as a Muslim and very close to others as a Hindus. Because if it's ultimately we're talking about humanity, justice, freedom, respect, care for the environment, care for those around us, we wouldn't go too far off. Ultimately, the things that we're going to differ on are things that, you know, in terms of our belief is what's going to happen next. And I'm willing to, you know, to leave you that space to decide that Christi the Christians are going to be salvaged or Buddhists are going to be salvaged. Or that's your prerogative. That doesn't affect my position and my area and my rights here. It doesn't. So when we come to the issue of um, raising children, freedom of religion and raising children, you see, I've had this discussion a lot, and um, I also recently got involved in the debate about creationism, evolution, and the such, and I personally don't think that it's either or. I think that we can also, as Muslims, for instance, who believe in creation, in, 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 in that there is a God that created all things, and that evolution is part of all this, uh, that evolution did actually happen, but not outside the realm of, so I'm willing to, to, to subscribe to that. I mean, this is not my area, but what I mean is, when we were having this debate, people would say, well, you know, but you're bringing up your children according to creationism, so that's not fair because you're immediately bringing them up to be prejudiced against uh, evolution. And, you know, we, we discussed this for a bit, and then I said, listen, are you saying that we should take away the right of parents to bring up their children according to the, you know, to what they think is best? That's ridiculous. I'm going to bring up, I'm pretty sure that Azmi is going to instill in his children the love of Tottenham Hotspur, which is, by the way, to me, it's even worse than anything else. <laughs> you can't be a guna. <laughs> so, so what I, so, I mean, the, we have to appreciate the fact that as parents, you have that right and that responsibility to bring up your children according to what you think is best. But at the same time, amongst those teachings that you are from this heritage, you are from this lineage, you are from this legacy, from the history, from this creed, from this religion. There are others who belong to other religions, creeds, histories, and legacies, and you need to respect those. They are equal human beings. They practice things according to what they see right. So you instill with them the confidence in what you have raised them towards, but also that open mind, so that at any moment of their time, of their lives, they come to a point where they have this inner debate with themselves. And every human being does, by the way. Whether they be a Muslim, uh, Christian, whether they be agnostic, atheist, they come to a particular moment of time, several times maybe even, where they question their own faith. Where they say, you know, am I on the, 
you know, doing things right? Do I believe in the right things? Everyone does. And if people have the attitude, the right kind of mentality, and the ability, the capacity, and the awareness, and the open-mindedness to do that, and society allows them the safe zone, you know, to question those, and to go and ask, and to interact with others and the such, you shouldn't be afraid. That shouldn't be a source of fear. But like I said, once again, we're asking questions because we live in a climate of fear, a climate of us and the other, a climate of dividing walls, and you need to decide on which wall you are at. By the way, there's a very, I mean, since Azmi today has talked about Hollywood, it talks about films, about Rocky, about Russell Crowe, and all these things, I think I should do the same. I mean, just a <clears throat> There's a very interesting film uh, out, and I'm, uh, maybe some of you have read the, the books, Divergent. Um, if it's around, go and see it. I'm not sure whether that's banned as well. Maybe, I, <laughs> maybe I've, I've landed everyone here, here in, a, in, a, in, a, in hot water. But anyway, if you can see it, also it's about uh, people of various characteristics, and ultimately people have to decide which group they belong to. And to be honest, you know, uh, if it all works to the betterment of society on a collective level, I shouldn't be afraid of, you know, it shouldn't worry me. It shouldn't worry me at all. Um, the question regarding Islamophobia and whether it's, it's possibly because of uh, the nature of Islam. Now, you see, I'm willing to accept that that's a point of view that's out there. But also, if I was to come back, and, and here, by the way, you know, I'm going to speak as a Muslim because this question, regards, so, so do, you know, uh, do forgive me, but uh, I, it's not that I'm trying to, <laughs> to, you know, to force my opinions on anyone, but just to answer the question, um, according to most statistics, as I believe, Islam is the, is the religion which most people are embracing out of all the main faiths and religions and creeds. And to me, that answers several questions. That, that sort of provides uh, an insight into the questions of uh, Islam being inhumane, being very difficult for people to follow and the such. I would say, well, why is it then that people are embracing Islam more than other, uh, other religions? The other thing is when I'm often confronted by um, the claim that uh, Islam oppresses and subjugates women inherently, uh, subjugates women. There are obviously many Muslims that subjugate and, uh, uh, and oppress women. There's, there's no doubt. But I'm here talking about uh, an, inheric, an inherent organic trend within Islam to subjugate and inherit. Uh, according to a recent uh, stat that I, I think it was in the Times, in the London Times recently, it showed that um, uh, there were certain figures about how many people embraced Islam in Britain over the past five, six years. Um, and it showed that more than 79% of them were women. So to me, that also is a surprising element. If I was to take the first claim into consideration that Islam subjugates women, why would women then be attracted to Islam? Why is that? Why is that? So I would suggest that the problem is not the rigidity of, 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 of the laws of Islam. Um, I would suggest that it's the rigid rigidity of the interpretation of those laws by Muslims across times. Uh, the literalists, those who want to do things as they were done uh, 1400 years ago during the times of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, those are rigid, but actually Islam, I believe, is extremely adaptable. And, uh, <coughs> And to prove that, uh, Islam is, is, is still in operation, it's still fairly dynamic uh, in most places around the world. And people are Muslims from China to Mexico to you know, Chile to N Norway. We find Muslims in practicing their faith within whatever context they live in, not just in, in Muslim lands. In fact, most Muslims live as minorities in non-Muslim countries. Um, in regards with the re reformation or ad adaption of religion, I have often spoken to, uh, to my friends who belong to other faiths, and to them, the main problem of their faith, I mean, particularly I had a discussion recently with, uh, with the friends from uh, the Anglican Church, <coughs> and their problem is that they say that the, cha the church is just changing too much. I mean, as one of my friends, he said, he said, you know, is this a religion or is this some sort of convenience club? Because he said it seems that we're opening up to whatever the, the, the media pushes us to open up to. And he's not happy about that. Now, I'm not going to 
talk about the Christian faith because that's not my area. But I would suggest from a Muslim's point of view that a religion and a faith is a serious thing. It is a serious thing. It is a commitment. It's, it's a devotion, a submission to, to a belief. And, you know, when I entered this club, if you wish, when I subscribed to this club, I, I subscribed to its conditions, terms and conditions. If it was to change its terms and conditions every, you know, every year or the such, it would be, a, you know, slightly inconvenient. Ultimately, five, da five years down the road, I'd be, I'd be in, a, in a club that was totally different to the one that I joined five years ago. So, from that point of view, I don't see that the problem is that Islam uh, or Islamic laws are rigid. In fact, if anything, I find myself you know, quite comfortable with, with Islam, never tempted to leave Islam because of the rigidity. In fact, I, I, I think that Islam is a, <coughs> it's quite adaptable, quite lenient, quite uh, easy, but it's Muslims themselves, how they practice Islam, that make it tough and make it difficult. Um, and, um, but I, I, you know, I, I'd like to finish with, uh, and I think that we are done, aren't we? Okay, I didn't actually get the whole uh, question that you wanted from early marriage, but what I would say is this, from what I understood. <coughs> the thing is that often we, we look at today's world, our tastes, preferences, lifestyles, and we are told that this is the best. This is it. This is how things should be. I mean, the other day I was in a, in a TV debate and someone said that the pinnacle of hum, human achievement is uh, democracy in the systems that we have today. And I said, God, if that's the pinnacle, then we have no hope whatsoever. I'm hoping that we could achieve much, much better than this. And that's the arrogance of, of human beings. Even the, the argument about science and religion. I mean, my argument is, you know, fine, fine. Don't, you know, you, you believe in, in the you know, predominance of science, and I totally take on science and my religion. But my problem with those who follow this, this argument is that they say, oh, they, they do not subscribe to the possibility that we may come to new discoveries as we go along. It's as though, you know what, the latest discovery from Harvard is this, that's it, that's the end, close that book, that's, that, that's how things should be measured. The same with our lifestyles, simply because now the age of marriage is 18, we now look back in horror, you know, at certain other cultures and contexts where be, by, it's fairly normal for men and women to get married at the age of 14, for instance, or 13. It used to be allowed even in Europe. People used to get married at the age of 10 and 11. So it's not that we recognize that we have moved on and we have come uh, to create laws that um, assign a, a minimum age of marriage, but we come to condemn hundreds of years ago, or other countries and cultures, for what they're doing. It's, I find that this is part of our modern arrogance. That what I do in London is the way that everything should be done. This is how it should be. Anyone who does anything different is wrong, sometimes even immoral and, and, and inhuman. And that is extremely problematic. And it's the same when we talk about how, you know, there were certain marriages um, a thousand years ago, um, where girls were 11, 12, and boys were 13, 14, they would get their married. And we look in horror. Oh, you know, how horrific this is. This was a thousand years ago. I could now go to some African countries where this is still practiced. And people don't see it as horrific at all. So this uh, issuing blanket judgments on other cultures. Let me give you an example. I don't know whether this is part of the debate here. But it was a very big part of the debate in the Western world and still is. And funnily enough, it was part of the debate even in the issue of Egypt and the coup. I don't know why, but I'll tell you. It's about female circumcision. Did you have that? It's called in, in we have an abbrevi abbreviation for it. It's called uh, FGM, female genital mutilation, yeah? To me, to me, uh, as an... Iraqi Arab as someone who's brought up in Britain, it's horrific. I couldn't bring myself to even think about it. In Islam, it's nowhere to be seen in Islam. But one day, 
I spoke about it in a trip that I had to Tunisia. And I gave an example of some of the issues that we're having, and I spoke about female circumcision. Afterwards, I was asked by a lady, who was, by the way, secular. And she said, I want to have a word with you. And she was quite angry. And I thought, I'm, I'm in for a lot of trouble here. So I, you know, after I finished saying hello to whoever, I, she took a side and she said, who gave you the right to condemn this act? And I said, and I thought, my God, I mean, am I hearing this? And I said, what are you talking about? Why? Of course, this is, she said, you have, and she told me off, she said, you have absolutely no right to talk about a cultural exercise that myself my mother, my grandmother, and my daughters take part in voluntarily and willingly, and we celebrate. You have no right to say that we are wrong, that we are anti-Islamic. She taught me a lesson there and then. The things that I shouldn't impose my culture, my taste, my preferences on others. This is the kind of colonial mind that I think that you were talking about. That what the Brits do is the best, and that's what everyone should do. And that we go around the world spreading the message and making people more civilized, the natives, you know, the, the, the savages. This is absolutely wrong. And um, uh, I, I think that, that a little bit of humility in our argument, whether it be on a faith base, whether it be on an ideological level, I think we need a little bit of humility, self-respect and the acknowledgement and appreciation of the other. Yeah, nice, thank you. Uh, I guess you have to know as well that uh, called uh, female circumcision, our religious body in Malaysia, Jakim, had issued a fatwa that it is wajib for, <laughs> for Muslims <laughs> to undergo circumcision. No, no, Jakim, Jakim, Jakim. Yeah, it is a fatwa by Jakim, right? And, and to the honor is that, um, they requested us from the Islamic uh, Mus uh, um, the Imam Islamic Medical Association of Malaysia to endorse circumcision for women, right? So as a surgeon, I would say that you know, like you have uh, many benefits for circumcision for men, but not a single one. But in fact, that it is hazardous to the women. So it must be, you know, uh, eradicated from from our community at all cost. Right, so I guess uh, we are going to wrap up this session and uh, uh, before I wrap up, I would uh, like to call upon uh, Julia to give her final words. Um, well, questions are not solved. But the discussion was quite productive. Um, I was sitting there and also wanted to ask a question, but I didn't have an opportunity because I wanted for everybody who are here to, to ask your questions. Um, so maybe wrapping up, I wanted to give, uh, <laughs> to, to present my own question or rather a humble opinion. Um, uh, uh, Zairil, I think he mentioned here that according to some Pew research um, of some recent years, Malaysia becoming worse than some uh, the so-called Islamic countries like Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and Iran in terms of uh, human rights and freedoms. I believe it's still not, but it's going along that path. Uh, for example, if we I remember that um, at the dawn of Islamic, the Islamic Revolution, the anti-Shah Revolution in Iran of uh, 1979, the Islamic Party here, PAS, uh, was looking with a great inspiration at the example of Iran, thinking if it should be implemented here in Malaysia. But now uh, they don't talk about it anymore. It, this hope seems faded away. But I comparing, I see that Malaysia deliberately is going along that path, actually, because what's going on in Iran, that uh, not really successful example of establishing the Islamic s State based on some doctrine, uh, made people hypocrites. It's a country of hypocrites, Munafakin. And I see Malaysia is moving along the same lines when you are 
it's it's a compulsion for you to worship if you're coming to your workplace you should worship otherwise people will consider that you are not pious and you are not complying uh, with the requirements here in Malaysia if you are um, going to the state service if you are Malay Muslim and uh, can you imagine that um, you don't wear hijab but you succeed it, it's deliberately becoming a must if uh, we're gonna get uh, even more uh, compulsory, such a compulsory mandatory things here, like, um, let's say like in the Egyptian, how you should pray, uh, how women should wear, uh, how you should live your life. People are getting sick of it because we cannot have Islam everywhere, especially in multi-ethnic and multi-religious country. Uh, but what becomes the case here? Um, we all gathered here today and the things we discussed, they seem very objective, very clear and obvious for us. O of course, we are here uh, at the um, event organized by organization who is for people who think, like Aumineta uh, Fakarun. But there is another world in Malaysia, the parallel world, and I don't think it's only the case of Malaysia. There's always some kind of parallel world and I don't even uh, think it's extremist because it's quite large. Uh, and the discussions there in this parallel world are quite different. When you try to discuss with people about uh, Islam, how Islam should be implemented, Isla Islamic or secular state, um, these people start quoting Quran. They always refer to the Quran. The problem is they never make a distinction between what Quran as a word of God is and their understanding of Quran and their exceptions of Quran, from Quran that they make are. And for me, the question always was that how we can discuss um, these numerous issues that we have of uh, social construction with those people who are rigid, and it was mentioned rigid to understand and rigid to think about the ground which we, they stand on. The ground that, at the moment, you just stand and look at this ground. Is it right what I'm doing? Is it right what I'm following? No, there is no this kind of questioning. And my question was how for us to organize the productive talk between groups like people who think, people who are not used to think, people who do not wish to think, but for us to reach to some positive result for some perfection of our society, disregarding the face um, and ethnicities. Uh, I suppose that this question remains unanswered. <laughs> um, with this, I think we will wrap up our um, today's event. And I think all the speakers, Dr. Anna Satikriti, Dr. Azmi Sharom, uh, Dr. Ahmad Farouk Musa, and uh, um, Zairil from Penang Institute. Uh, I just wanted to announce shortly that we're going to have um, several events with, uh, events with Dr. Anasa Tikriti with, uh, the following, uh, on the following days. Um, one is tomorrow at uh, Global Moderates Foundation at uh, 10 o'clock. At 11 o'clock, we're having a lecture. And one on Tuesday, 